What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Jordan Slover of NeonAmbition.com. And Jordan, I always like to mention other episodes people should check out before I formally introduce you. And since this is uh, part of the agency series, um, I had um, Jason Swank on. Uh, He was a great guest. He actually talked about building up his agency to over eight figures and selling it and then how they're acquiring agencies now. Um, Todd Tasky also has a second bite podcast where he talks about how he matches private equity with an agency and they sell and sometimes get more on the second bite than they did on the first. I also want to give a shout out to Alex Galoose. We were talking, Jordan and I were talking before we hit record on B2B SaaS is a difficult market in a lot of respects. And Alex has a podcast, The Revenue Engine, but he helps B2B SaaS companies with their paid uh, ads, essentially. Um, and he only specializes in that because it's it's kind of a tough industry uh, as far as that goes. But this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're actually an easy button for a company to launch and run their podcast. We do the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. And, you know, Jordan, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and profile and share what they're working on and their expertise. So if you thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com. Happy to answer anything you throw our way. And I'm excited. We have Jordan Slover. Uh, He got us started online marketing working for Google. Uh, in NYC in London on the Google Analytics team. After a four-year stint in an agency in Australia, uh, which is one of my goals to to visit, uh, so I'm jealous, Jordan, he moved to Austin and founded Neon Ambition, uh, which is an online marketing agency focused on helping companies in some of the most competitive industries grow online. And when I was reading you know, some of the niches that you help with, Jordan, uh, I was like, why not just make it easier on yourself? <laughs> Well, I go after competitive niches, but I guess you like a challenge. And Jordan's company actually made the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies. And you can check them out at neonambition.com. And Jordan, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me, Jeremy. Happy to be here. So why competitive niches? Why? Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's not what I set out to do from day one. I'll say that. Um, but you know, it it almost is in the name a little bit, you know, uh, I'm ambitious. I love working with ambitious companies. And uh, that's really where where the name for the business came. I know that wasn't your question, but uh, I I, um, was going to name it Ambition Online Marketing. And I realized how boring that was. And um, so decided to throw neon in in front of Ambition to kind of jazz it up. And um, (laughs) that's how we got the name. And, you know, just over the years, we started working with um, personal injury attorneys, some of the highest, you know, CPCs um, out there, uh, really cutthroat industry and and started having some success and really liking working in that uh, vertical. We um, got some clients in insurance going up against uh, Geico and Hartford and, you know, the the big, big boys of... uh, They spend a lot of money too, right? They do, they do, yeah. And um, you know, we started working with a insurance company that was pretty new to the market, and um, that was the competition. And we just said, you know, giddy up, let's let's do it. And um, I've built um, a team I'm you know really proud of, and they're all um, just as competitive as as I am, and um, you know, uh, when when we see you know an SEO client that has keywords that SEM rush say are very hard or very difficult, you know, um, those are the ones that we get excited about and, uh, and go after. And we've, we've had a lot of success in those industries. So, you know, we'll take the, we'll, 
we'll take the easy ones too. Don't, don't get me wrong, but you know, we don't shy away from the difficult stuff either. Talk a little bit. I know I, you know, give a brief intro, but add some color, talk about neon ambition uh, and what you do there. Sure. So we are a lead gen focused agency. Um, you know, we're really uh, trying to get the phone to ring or people to fill out the form and um, have worked in a wide variety of industries over over the years. But, you know, in, in many ways are like a lot of other online marketing agencies, um, you know, just doing Google ads, um, social media ads, SEO, web design, uh, content marketing or HubSpot partner as well. Um, so, yeah, we kind of focused on, on lead gen and um you know just like helping our our clients grow you know um i was i was pumped to make think 5000 list but i'm i'm even more excited when our customers make it so love it i want to talk you know you didn't start your own agency out of the gate you actually worked for an agency for almost 4 years um i'd love to hear what did you learn from that and that was in australia yeah so i um, after I left, uh, Google, um, traveled a bit and ran out of money in Australia. And, um, so I got a job working for a web design agency and was, um, on the sales team selling websites and, uh, pretty quickly kind of came to the realization, you know, it's great that we're helping these companies with their website, but what are they going to do once we launch it? You know, we, we need to kind of help them market their website. And my boss said, you know, can you do that? And I said, well, I certainly can try. And, um, you know, started the, the online marketing division um, for the agency I was working at. And, um, you know, even though I worked at Google, I was on the Google Analytics team. So, you know, it's not like I was learning about SEO and at Google. Um, and I wasn't on the Google Ads team either. So, well, of course, I knew about Google Ads, but I wasn't on the, the ad side of the business there. So really, uh, the agency experience I had in in Sydney was where I learned a lot about um, SEO and and pay per click and paid social, and also where I learned you know some of the dodgy things that happen in the industry you know um, and it kind of really opened my eyes um, to you know just how many bad online marketing agencies there are. And, and I'm not speaking about the one I was at. The one I was at was was not one of these bad apples. But when I was speaking to the prospective clients and they were telling me about the other quotes they were getting and hearing about guarantees or um, you know, un untransparent uh pricing policies. I mean, you know, I could I could go on and on about some of the dodgy things that I heard. And it just made me think like, wow, you know, I, I feel bad for these people that are small, medium sized business owners, not specialists in online marketing. And, you know, some of these companies are trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And um, I just wanted to start an agency that was the opposite of that and, and do everything the right way for our clients. Um, so, you know, we still run into that even today, you know, I wish I could say that I don't see that stuff anymore. But, you know, when we take uh, clients over from other agencies, I mean, this happened uh, probably each of the past three months where we took over a, a client from a previous agency. And instead of handing us over all of the WordPress files that we need to transfer their site over, they just dump us, you know, some content and some design files and, and you know, say, here you go. And, they could have just easily given us that little bit extra of information to make the transfer in the website over easier, but they, they don't want to make it easy on anyone to leave. And, um, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know why some agencies operate that way. Talk about, you know, from you've seen things of what people should watch out for from a consumer perspective, you mentioned, guarantees and some other things what would be an example of something that you saw that you're thinking you know how are they doing that yeah well you know um to that website example i mean uh, some of these um companies you know will build you a website but you don't really own 
you know, the website. It's built on their proprietary CMS. So I kind of try to help educate people that, you know, proprietary CMS is not WordPress. It's not something you can just take to any any other firm um, easily. You know, they're trying to kind of lock you into their their universe there. And um, that's going to make it difficult for you in the end. Um, some other things that I see are, like I said, un, unclear um, pricing policies. We, we have one pretty large competitor who will just, you know, say it's 20 grand a month and that covers your SEO and your, your paid search. But what's their management fee? You know, uh, it's very unclear. Like, and even their reporting, they'll brag about this beautiful dashboard, but you look at the dashboard and there's no CPC data. There's no total spend to Google data. Um, and you don't actually own your Google ads account. I mean, that's a big one that I actually tried to work with Google to get this policy reversed. Um, when I was at Google, I was on the Google Analytics partner program. So I was dealing with Google Analytics partners. So then when I started an agency and joined the Google ads partner program, I tried working my connections to say, hey, you know, this policy that you have where if you pay your agency, if a, if a client pays the agency 20 grand a month to manage their Google ads campaign, and the agency is the one paying Google, Google views the agency owner as the owner of the account because it's the agency paying the bills. And so if you leave that agency as the customer, you don't get access to your account and all that history. And, you know, I just think that's an insane policy. Um, How do you like the structure of them? Well, you know, I, I think it's the client's ultimately paying that bill, you know, it's their account. All of the information in there is about their business and they're, they're ultimately paying for it. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, the way we do it is we always, you know, uh, either set up a brand new account or take over someone's account and make our clients admin and they own the account and, and we're just, you know, stewards of it. Um, so you know, I, I usually joke like 17 years from now when you sell the business and don't want to work with us anymore, um, you know, <laughs> you're not going to have to worry about uh, ownership of of the campaign. You know, um, we see that with Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager where clients don't even have logins to their, their own analytics. Um, Is there a risk, Jordan, from the agency's standpoint of doing that if they're footing the bill? I mean, is there a possibility, I don't know if it happens, that the client, they have to bill the client for that money, but they're footing the bill up front for those people, right? I mean, Google, so we have our clients put their own credit card down and right. Google just bills them as the... Yeah. I mean, not in your case, but in the other case, if an agency is running it through their account, they're footing the bill up front for that client, right? Yeah, unless the client pays in advance, you know. Um, Got be. it. Yeah. So I could see, I don't know if that's a risk from the agency perspective, just to run it that way if, you know, if the client doesn't pay the bill, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if, it were, if, if we had that business model, which we don't, I would certainly make clients pay up, up front before we footed the bill. But, um, you know, we don't do it that way. I want to talk in this is um a conversation with a lot of agencies. So from the the um Sydney agency um you know some of the things you learned as far as you know you you brought this new division was there anything on the sales side you know because that was kind of your your one of your roles there is the sales what works um, and what was kind of a methodology that you use and you have your team use for, that works with kind of the sales process? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, you know, I, I don't know if this is uh, related or, or not, but maybe it is. I haven't really thought about it. Um, but both my parents were teachers. Uh, my mom was a second grade teacher for 35 years. And my dad was a high school art teacher. This is actually a self-portrait he did when he was uh, like about 30. Um, 
he painted himself as a matador, which I find hilarious. <laughs> he was not a matador. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I don't know if that's part of it, but I, I have always tried to help our prospective clients understand that while SEO is complicated and Google ads have a lot of moving pieces that, you know, these are smart business people that have started a business. And um, if they want to understand how it works, all they need to do is give me time. You know, um, so I spend a, a lot of time um, in the sales process just trying to educate because, you know, um, I want people to understand, you know, what we're doing and uh, why and, um, you know, have a, have a pretty good understanding of, of how it all works, you know. What are some common mistakes that you see people making when you're educating them uh, that they make with the SEO component? Well, um, not doing enough research on the company that they're considering going with, you know, um, I think is, is a big one. This is a, a pretty big decision for most businesses. You know, you're, you're usually hiring an agency, not thinking it's going to be a short-term solution, right? You, you're hoping that you make the right choice and that this is going to be the agency that's going to help you grow for years to come. And I see a lot of people kind of rushing through the, the process and not doing their due diligence. Um, you know, I've had prospects who will tell me who we're up against, you know, hey, you're in the final two, you know, just got to, you've got to present to the boss and the other agency is going to present to the boss. And I'll always try to find out who we're up against. Don't always do that. But if I can, the last two times that I found out who we're up against, I look them up on LinkedIn, just, you know, because I haven't heard of them. You know, you can't uh, roll a tennis ball down the street without rolling past four online marketing agencies, you know. Um, so there's, you know, it's impossible to keep track of all of them. So I look them up on LinkedIn. And, you know, the last one that I looked up was, um, you know, a firm based out of Atlanta. And that's how he described them to me. I was like, I've never heard of them. Where, where are they based? He's like, Atlanta. I'm like, okay. I look them up and they're on LinkedIn and yes, one guy is in Atlanta and the other three people at the agency, there's only four people at the entire agency were in Jakarta and Bangladesh, which is, you know, fine if that's what you, uh, you know, are looking for, but they didn't know that they thought they were based out of Atlanta and they thought they were a much bigger firm because their website tried to portray them as a, a big agency. And I was just like, Hey, is this who you're talking about? Cause uh, you know, and he's like, Oh my gosh, I didn't know any of that. You know um, the time before that I looked up, you know, and we have a big SEO team and uh, SEO director with 15 years of experience and uh, another SEO with 20 and another one with 15. You know, we got a really experienced SEO team here. And I looked up who we were up against and the only person listed at this other company on the SEO team was a mechanic two years ago, which again, like totally, you know, wonderful pr profession, but you know, my, my people have been doing SEO for 15 years. Like, do you think this person who has been doing it for two years is gonna, you know, get you the same results? Um, only being the only person at the whole company, you know, that, that does SEO for all of their clients. Um, so I, I just think you got to dig deeper. You know, I, I, um, I also interview a ton of SEOs and a ton of account managers because we're growing and we're constantly looking for better talent. And, um, you know, I interview account managers who uh, have 30, 40 accounts assigned to them, you know, which is that's like impossible, I think, um, to, to properly service that many accounts. I've interviewed SEOs who had 120 accounts that they worked on a month. There's 187 working hours in a month. If, if, if all you do is SEO every day, you know, eight hours a day, that's one and a half hours per client a month. You know, that's, and, and we all know you can't do that. You have meetings and, you know, um, so it's, I, I think clients really should spend more time vetting the agencies that they're going to hire. What do you look for? You know, you're growing. What do you look for in an account manager? Mm. 
Good question. Um, someone who's whip smart, you know, um, we, we generally are looking for someone who has at least five years of agency experience already. Um, you know, it's one of the things I'm realizing about how I've built the agency that's different from a lot of agencies is I've always tried to hire the most talented people I could afford and the most experienced people. Um, it's not the way a lot of agencies do it. In fact, I'm part of a, a peer group. Um, I'll give a shout out to agencymanagementinstitute.com run by a guy named Drew, who is um I've wonderful. had Drew on the podcast. Oh, have you? Yeah, yeah he's wonderful. Highly recommend uh, you sign up for his newsletter at the very least. But, you know, I'm part of his one of his peer groups. And he'll he'll tell you that, you know, the way most agencies make money is have a few senior people and a lot of junior woodchucks was was his words. And, uh, you know, I raised my hand and said, Drew, I don't have any junior woodchucks, you know. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, as we get bigger, we, you know, start to realize the need for, for more junior people, you know, you don't need senior people doing everything. Um, but even so I try to kind of limit that to people that have still had, you know, uh, five years of experience. Um, and I think I lost track of your question to be honest. No, I was like, uh, what do you look for in account manager? Oh yeah. Account managers. Yeah. Well, um, someone that's that's been an account manager before, um, you know, is is required. Um, someone who has a lot of uh, experience in a digital agency, specifically, you know, I don't want to have to teach them about Google Ads or or SEO. Of course, they'll learn more coming here, but I like someone that has that experience. Um, but you know, personality is is uh, you know important in the role. Um, they're managing the relationship. Um, they need to be super organized, um, you know, and, and just someone that you want to work with every day, you know, um, how do you, you know, when you're, you know, through the hiring process, how are you, it's, it's tough. Sometimes people sometimes put their best foot forward. Um, how do you, what do you have in the process to kind of decide, is this person organized? You like their personality. I mean, maybe you do off the bat. Um, I don't know. The interview process is a little bit uh, a microcosm of is it real or not? Yeah. What does the hiring process look like? Yeah, we certainly have you know had that happen in the past, and it can be frustrating when you try to put people through their paces, and um, and then you know they start and maybe aren't uh, exactly who who they said they were. I. I I halfway anticipated you might ask about a, a book that I like reading. So I kept this uh, handy. Have you heard of this book? Yeah. By um, Jeff Smart and Randy Street. I keep yeah. this on my desk. All, at all if time. you're if you're just listening and but if you're watching the video, he held up the book who. And yeah. I actually had the CEO of Top Grading on my podcast, and I believe that's his son uh who wrote that and the dad wrote top grading yeah i think that's right um although i'm not positive but i'll, I'll take your word yeah. for it ceo they, of chris mersa runs top grading but there the book is top grading hiring a players and i think his son wrote who um i believe yeah that sounds right and you know it's got a sample you know interview questions and um uh yeah top grading interview questions and um, you know, how to check references. Um, and, you know, we try to follow that as, as closely as we can. We're not perfect. Um, but it's kind of, I guess, what I was saying with prospects need to do more due diligence on their agencies. You, you know, they recommend uh, asking for seven or eight references. You know, and ideas you know everyone can kind of give you two three people that 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 like you you know and can speak favorably of you but give me eight you know um do we ask for eight references from everyone no to be honest but i do try to ask for as many as they'll give me and actually call them and talk to them and um you know there's a very specific specific set of questions that you ask and the way that you ask them to get people to open up and um, 
you know, we, we do our best because it's obviously the number one um, biggest challenge of running an agency is having uh, um, really talented people to do the work. Jordan, is there, uh, I know there's a lot of questions and pieces of the process. And if you don't remember, that's fine. Is there one question that sticks out that you remember reading from the book or that you're like, this one's especially important in that I ask in the process? Well, there's one um, reference question since we we're talking about references that um, I, I think is particularly interesting and I might not be explaining it the best because I, I wasn't prepared for this. But um, one of the questions is, what were the person's biggest areas for improvement back then? And the, the book goes on to explain that saying back then really psychologically opens people up to feeling okay to talk about something someone might not have been good at. So I usually will ask it even, I'll even go a little deeper and say, you know, obviously it's been a few years since you worked with them or how, you know, however long it's been since they've worked with them. It usually has been a couple of years at least, you know? And so, you know, maybe they've improved on this since then, but, you know, back then, was there anything that, that they can improve on? And it seems to work, you know, people really, do kind of open up and latch on to that. Yeah, well, you know, they, they maybe have gotten better at this. You know, I can't say for certain, but back then, let me tell you this and that, you know. Um, so that that question I always really like. I love that. Yeah. Jordan, I know a lot of the agencies that I talk to um, really think a lot about the topic of niching down, right? Should I niche down? How much do I niche down? If I niche down, will I turn away this segment that I already serve a lot of? So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, because you serve a number of industries, right? You serve, like you said, you know, PI attorneys, you mentioned the uh, insurance, uh, you know, the insurance genre. I know that you help home builders. Um, How do you think about the topic of niching down for an agency? Yeah, so um, it's really a, a tricky one for me because we we didn't start off uh, niche down. Although I did make the decision to specialize in lead gen and not try to be you know all things to all people and have e commerce and lead gen. So uh, you know, in a way, we had a small niche of lead gen. Uh, it's not that niche, um, but you know that enabled us to focus from day one on that. And then um, as we got more and more personal injury clients and had more and more success there and, and you know, like that industry and, and like, um, not everyone has a, a, a great opinion of personal injury lawyers, but I, I certainly do because, you know, the stories we hear of um, people that they, they help that have gone through really traumatic things and, and how they're able to help them and change their lives. Um, really gives a lot of meaning to the work that we do for them. Um, so we we certainly have worked with a lot of personal injury lawyers. And, um, you know, do I change the ambition to be 100% personal injury? Do I not? It's a constant question going on um, in the back of my mind. And we haven't made that decision to do that yet because we, we do uh, have a lot of success in other industries and it keeps it different for the people working on it. They're not working on the same thing every time we get to try new things. So I don't know that I have the answer, um, Jeremy, but, you know, I I do see a lot of, I do have some other agencies that I track that have niched into a couple of niches, right? They do pest control and then they've got another website that's whatever, you know, dental practices. And so uh, there's obviously people have handled it in, in different ways. Yeah, there's there's a lot to be said for niching. You really get to know the industry and um you know get really good and efficient at it. Um and, and so I understand why why people do it. We're we're kind of um trying to trying to niche and and also service um other good clients. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's enabled us to to turn away business that's far from from what we're trying to accomplish. But like I said, that's kind of why we're, you know, talking about highly competitive industries because we, we, we don't want to turn away 
um, you know, a good client in a really competitive industry. Yeah. That's going to be a fun project for us. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's talk about some examples, but I, I like how you put it, you know, one thing is looking at niching into a specific service. So you're talking lead gen. And the other is also a way to think about niching is in industry, right? Um, and even broad, like super competitive industries. And under that, for you, that falls certain things like PI attorneys or insurance companies and things like that. So um, let's talk about an example so I can understand a little bit about what your company does. Um, there's a PI attorney that you helped um, out of Arizona mm -hmm. and what were some of the things you did with them? Yeah. So um, this, this attorney came to us uh, like a lot of people do um, really um, have been burned in the past. You know um, I sometimes kind of half joke that my, my role at Neon Ambition is, um, is like SEO therapist. Um, sometimes the first five, 10 minutes of a call with a prospect is just hearing about how they can't believe they're talking to another SEO company. They've been burned so many times in the past and they're really not sure if it's going to work, but they see it work for other people. They don't know why it's not working for them. Uh, you know, and five, 10 minutes go by and I, I, I only just been listening. Yes, I understand. Um, I understand, you know, we, We've all been burned before, but we have to learn to love again, you know? <laughs> um, right. So, um, you know, remind That's, me of a question, Jeremy. No, I was just saying um, the uh, attor PA attorney in Arizona. Oh, yes. Yeah, you oh, were yeah. saying I'm how. Sorry, yeah. So he was, he was like that and um, had been burned a lot of times. And so yeah. I, I just... Um, you know, we were able to over a very long sales process, you know, that we kind of alluded to earlier, really do a lot of competitive industry and uh, competitive research and examine his site and audit his Google ads campaign and, you know, try to set realistic expectations with them as to what we can do for him. Um, you know, that's a huge part of my job here as well is just realistic expectation setting. Um, something that I think people have to watch out for in the industry. Um, you know, I always try to help people understand I'm the owner of the agency. And, and so, you know, setting realistic expectations is, is huge for me. I'm not here to just like collect my commission check and don't care what happens in six months. You know, it's, it's my name on the line in six months, whether you're going to keep going with us or not. Um, so was able to break through, you know, um, and, and we, we took over his ad campaign and, and took over his SEO and, um, he just had a, a record breaking year and, averaging over a case a day, um, which for, for his size firm was, was his goal. Um, and, um, so what yeah. was the difference there, Jordan? So someone who's worked with three other for whatever number of firms yeah. and now you come in and the person has not had success before. Yeah. Right. So what was the difference? Well, it's my team, you know, it's, um, anytime you're hiring an agency, you're, you're hiring people, and and you're paying for their time and expertise, you know. So, the the thing about SEO, and and I think that's hard for potential clients to choose the right SEO company. And I'm very aware of is that we all sound the same. We all say we're going to do technical audit, and then we're going to do keyword research, and then we're going to write content for you, and then we're going to build backlinks for you. And I know the words coming out of my mouth, they've already heard it three, four times, you know? Um, and the reality is this is the way the algorithm works. And, and this is, you know, what you have to do to be successful, but the devil's in the details, you know, um, how good is, are your copywriters, you know, uh, how much content are you going to be producing each month? You know, um, does the agency have an editor on staff? This is a good question. <laughs> I, it, it's amazing how many competitors I look up who don't don't have an editor uh, on their website or on LinkedIn, you know, and they just expect the client to edit the content. Um, or do they even have copywriters? You know, uh, some agencies make their SEOs or account managers write copy, right? Um, so these are the questions that I try to help people understand as they're evaluating us and, you know, often getting three, four other quotes. Is, you know, these are some of the questions that that 
an agency is not going to just, you know, tell you we don't have an editor on staff or our, our SEOs write content, you know, they're, they're just going to tell you they write content, you know, um, a lot of SEO companies talk about building backlinks, but they don't talk about how quality are those backlinks going to be. And when I, uh, get into a situation where we've made, you know, the final two and people are trying to compare apples to apples. They say, you know, have you asked them how many backlinks they're going to be building for you each month, you know, and have you asked about what the quality of those backlinks will be? And they say, oh, no, it just says here and they'll read from the proposal, you know, monthly outreach. It's like, okay, well, you might want to ask, you know, how much monthly outreach and, and, you know, what are they, what kind of expectations are they setting? Right. And then they come back and they're like, yeah, they said they're going to build DR20 backlinks for us. And I'm like, that is not going to help you, you know, <laughs> and your and your industry is too competitive. Like, you know, we we average DR50 backlinks from many of our clients in these really competitive spaces because that's what it what you're going to need to move the needle, right? So, um, yeah, I just I I literally do feel for a lot of the people that I speak to because they're busy trying to run their be a lawyer or be a home builder, and they don't have time to to learn all of this, but I try to help them understand, you know, look, I've been doing this for like 14 years now. Um, you know, these are the the details that you have to look for and watch out for when choosing who you work with. And, and it's those devil, the, the devil is in the details there in terms of whether you're going to, whether it's going to work or not. Sure, and talk about expectations for a second. I think in SEO too, I don't, you know, is it a tough conversation? Because it, let's say someone else is setting false expectations. Okay. And you have to go in and be like, hey, this may take six months or a year of building this because it's super competitive, right? Yeah. What are expectations like in the PI world that, I mean, you know, we've all heard, you know, you want to under promise, over deliver, whatever the saying is, but what is a realistic expectation that people should have? Yeah. I, I always joke and tell people my favorite part of selling SEO is telling them that there will not be ROI for the first six months, you know, <laughs> now it's not always the case. Uh, it's not always the case. And to answer your question, it's, it's very case by case, right? The, the thing about uh, SEO is that every website is starting in a different position, right? Did you just launch the website yesterday? Has it been around for five years, 10 years, 20 years? Uh, you know, how much content do you have versus the competition? How many backlinks and quality of backlink profile do you have versus the competition? So every single person I talk to, I have to do all of this research and competitive research to figure out where they are and where the competition is, and then figure out how to close that gap. And then, of course, you know, a lot of it comes down to budget. You know, um, you can do a little SEO or you can do a lot. You can write two pages a month or you can write 12 pages a month, right? You write two pages a month, it's going to take a lot longer to catch the competition. In some cases, you're never going to catch them. And that is where a lot of people go wrong with SEO. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are spending $2,000 or $3,000 a month on SEO, which seems to be like the, the number that any bad SEO company can convince someone who doesn't know about SEO to spend two or $3,000 a month. Um, because the people I, I speak to that are unhappy, have been spending two or three thousand dollars a month on SEO, getting one, two pages a month written for them, and then you look at who's dominating in their in their space, and they're pumping out you know uh, four pages a week. You know, um, you're trying to do two pages a month, and they're doing sixteen pages a month. You you're never gonna catch behind. them. You're never gonna catch them. You know, um, super interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's tough to have that conversation. I imagine like. The client doesn't want to hear that, right? We're not going to get, um, but sometimes you need to set real expectations for people. And yeah, you know, I just try to tell people I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to have you as a client for six months. I'm trying to have you as a client for six years, you know? So if, if I'm going to do my best to tell you what we can achieve over the next six months and, and show you the progress and, hopefully show you enough progress and prove to you that we know what we're doing, that you keep going with us after that. And, you know, 95% of our customers over the uh, nine years who've been in business have, have done that, you know? Um, 
So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tricky one. Not, not everyone signs up when they hear that, you know, <laughs> not a lot of people can afford to, um, to invest in something for six months with no ROI, but you know, even in those cases, there's always longer tail terms or less competitive terms. You know, it's, it's again about taking that conversation a little deeper, you know, Hey, you want to rank for car accident and attorney in, in New York city. So does everyone else. Right. But maybe you do construction accident, you know, or ladder accidents, um, you know, where search volume is not very high, not every PI firm does that, but someone falls off a ladder in New York city could be a $4 million case. Yeah. First of all, Jordan, I appreciate you walking through how you think about everything from sales to hiring to niching. Um, I have one last question. Before I ask it, I just want to point people, they can learn more at neonambition.com and uh, they can see you know, your most valuable team member, Walter White, um, on there, <laughs> the dog that's, from Breaking Bad. Um, but last question is on resources. I'd love to hear any other books, podcasts, or resources for for any, you know, founder, CEO, entrepreneur, or agency owner. I know you mentioned the book Who. Are there any yeah. other books or podcasts or just resources that you look at um, that you've looked at through your journey? Yeah, I mean, who is a big one? I keep that on my desk. Uh, it pretty much lives on my desk. And um, I mentioned the Agency Management Institute earlier. Drew does have a podcast. Um, I cannot remember the name of it right now. I'm so sorry, Drew. Um, but if you go to agencymanagementinstitute.com, I'm sure there's a link to his podcast there. If you're an agency owner, it's invaluable. Um, uh, other books besides that, I'm trying to look at my bookshelf. Kind of got books all over the place. Um, I mean, scaling up is, is, uh, another one, you know, um, that I really like. Uh, it's based off the Rockefeller principles written by a guy named Vern Harnish. Mm -hmm. yep. um, yeah. Um, so a lot of good information in there about that's a great one. Meeting schedules. Yeah. And... Uh, he's been on the podcast. So people can check out that episode that we did. Um, but yeah, great book scaling yeah. up. Love it. Um, well, Jordan, I'm in the first one to thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jordan. For having me, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, nice like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.